All right, guys. Welcome back, EYL. Yeah, yeah. This is an extremely special, <sighs> special edition. I'm excited. It's yeah. a special edition. I'm excited. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Before we before we start, we got some housekeeping items. So, if you follow EYL, you know we've been traveling around. We we're hitting all of our major markets. So, DC, DMV, Maryland, uh, Virginia. We are coming December 7th and December 8th. We got a whole EYL weekend planned and we're having a workshop on December 7th with two of our biggest alumni, Mobile Homes Elite and my guy Wall Street Trapper. So we're gonna have a a workshop about uh, investing in mobile homes and a workshop investing in real estate and um, stocks Stocks, combined. And um, MG the mortgage guy will be there as well, so yeah, you never yeah, know. Yeah. He might talk about real estate. We got a few alumni that might show up. Nah, it's yeah. gonna be a whole vibe. And then, <laughs> and then, so then that's Saturday, and then Sunday we're gonna have our very first live podcast ever, and we're gonna do it at Capital One Arena. Mm. That's where the Wizards play. Yeah, and they're crazy. giving us they're giving us the court. <laughs> and, yeah, yeah, they yeah, gave yeah. us the court. That's a they fact. The court. And then what, what they're gonna do is that anybody that comes to the podcast they get tickets to the game right after the podcast. Yes, yeah. yeah. but it's not just a regular game. They play the Clippers. And the Clippers have one of the best teams in the league. Yeah. One of the best players of all time, Kawhi True. Leonard. Yeah. And load management will not be. Load management will Lowe's not be. Man, fire, not in effect. Kawhi's playing. Paul George is playing. So yeah. So and we're also going to live stream the um, workshop too. Yeah. For fifteen dollars, pretty much giving it away. So um, if you're interested, go to earnyourleisure.com under the events tab, and all of the information is there. So. All right, so as I said, this is very special because, um, you know, music is is part of our it's DNA, hard. man. We, we, we grew up on, on hip hop specifically, and um, we just love music. So we talk, we always quote Jay Z all the time. <laughs> we always quote all these rappers, and because yeah. that's kind of how we grew up, just listening to rap. That's how we learn. Yeah, actually. That, was, that was our learning tool. Some some things we learned good, some things we learned bad. Right. right. <laughs> 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 but that's how we learn. So. My man Mickey Fax is 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 a perfect a perfect guest for EYL. So Love. he had a freestyle yeah. that about three months ago went viral yeah. on social media, and it was with Funk Flex, yeah. and he was talking about credit. Right. And when I saw the freestyle, a couple people had DM me like, "Yo, you should post this. You should post this." So when I actually sat down, because a lot of times you get stuff you don't really look at it. So once the third person hit me, I'm like, I should actually invest three <laughs> minutes of my time and look at this. Right. And then I looked at it. I'm like, yo, this is dope. So I reposted it, and then it went crazy on my page. And then we connected, and I'm like, yo, like, would you be interested in coming on the show? He's like, yeah, for sure. So I'll run it down. Um, he's a veteran, veteran in the rap game, over right. a decade of experience. He was yeah. on the, the um, Double XL Freshman of the Year cover. Yes, sir. Two, yeah. yeah, for yeah, sure, yeah, for yeah. sure. 2009 Freshman, right? Yes, yeah. sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. So shout, wait, we're Bronx native. We can't forget that. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. You, you know, know come on, Bronx, man. Bronx. Shout out to Corey. Yeah, yeah. yeah. shout, shout, out, to, shout out to Soundview, man. Uh-huh. You know, that's that's the birthplace of hip hop. Yes, that's sir, where that's sir. where it started, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. Yes, so um, yeah, man, just a veteran in the game. Um, have been on major labels, independent labels. Drop projects, works with some of the biggest names in hip hop history from Pick him. Drake to Kendrick Lamar. Pick him. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> over and over yeah. So, <laughs> so, so um, you know, it's, he's the perfect guest to have because, you know, when we talk about entertainment, a lot of times people have aspirations of being in the entertainment business, mm-hmm. but, um, you know, they don't really know how to how that works, right? And like yeah, I was yeah. telling Mickey off camera, it's like there's a lot more people that could relate to his story that could relate to Jay Z. Mm. Right, because as far as being an independent artist and making a living for yourself and going on tour and selling merch and all of this stuff, these are all things that are viable career. You're making a living out of it, right? Mm-hmm. right. Um, so it's like as an artist, there's no mentorship and there's no blueprint. Yeah, there's no manual for this. Yeah, <laughs> so, so no, Mickey, you Mickey, no Mickey gonna plan. give us some 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 free game. So yes, sir. First and foremost, man, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you for having me here, man. Oh, this is going to be good. Yeah, excited. This is gonna be we're excited to have you, man. Yeah. yeah. So, all right. So, we're going to kick it off a little different how we usually kick off the podcast. How are we kicking it off? All right. So, <laughs> so <laughs> what do you should say? This, this all started with the Funk Flex freestyle. Right. So, we're going to try to, we're we, we, we going to have one up on Flex. Yeah, okay. Yeah, one yeah, up yeah. on right. Flex. So, we're going to do our very first, we're breaking history. Very first wow. EYL freestyle. Yeah, my yeah. man's gonna bless us with a hundred bars. Yeah, yeah, at least a hundred. And we going and we gonna do it. So oh, um man. Yeah, whenever you're ready, man. Okay, cool. Uh so I'm doing this freestyle, you know what I'm saying, off of um band from TV. Shout out to Nori, Nature, Pun, RP, Cam, 
Styles and Jada. Yeah. Yeah. Swiss. Yeah. Swiss. And Swiss for making yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank for you, sure. Swiss. Swiss. Swiss from the Bronx, too. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so it's a Bronx kid. Um, you know what I mean? Um, and I hit up Rashad. I was like, you know, I want you to pick the topic. I want you to pick the beat. You know what I'm saying? So Troy picked the beat. Rashad picked the topic. Yep. So, you know, today we're going to be rapping about, you know what I'm saying, entrepreneurism. You know what I mean? Oh, man. Let's get it going. Let's do it. Mm. I'm excited. 2019. Yeah. <laughs> it's hours. <laughs> <it's> <laughs> Y'all saw what I did on the Flex show. Helping the people get out of debt, bro. Rashad gave me a call and told me to flex mo. Teach them how to work for themselves to get dope. I said, yo, you think they ready for that? He said, Mick, give yourself more credit than that. Just tell them the facts. That's when I start remembering back. Working at a law firm, sorting mail in the back. Going to work very poor. I'm making 20K at 24. And I can't take it anymore. So I made it my business to make my own business. Create my own lane that the game hasn't witnessed. Before I start, there's a good and a bad side But I'ma give you both, be the good and the bad guy Let's start with the good, cause you gotta find a niche Example, consider when Mars acquired Twix It was other chocolate bars right in the mix True. But the company made two of them and got rich They saw it was a need for something So they created a product to appease the public So you gotta do the same Invent something in your own lane Create the value for the customer you can gain You could put a barber shop next to a lounge Or start a laundromat in the College town, gotta know what you getting into. It's imperative. Research, don't go in blind due to your arrogance. A doctor can't start a business without knowing this medicine. An author can't start a series without knowing the narrative. Facts. Experiment with the benefits of your market. Know your demographic. Who you trying to start with? What is your business plan? Here's how you started. What is your company about? What do you call it? Lay out the services. Tell us about the product. Flesh out the numbers. What's your revenue target? That's what you make it. Now subtract what you spent. Just to make it, that's your profits and losses Yo, Troy, hold up, I might be speeding Keep The going. cop might give me a ticket from all the speaking I might get banned from TV with this preaching And Nori gonna have to re-release it as a remix In 06, <laughs> guys that mix tapes with DJs Wore baggy clothes and posed with a mean face I had glasses, skinny jeans, gold supers Cat saw that and said he had no future But they were wrong, cause people were connected They bought into the brand and it was respected But check it, I don't wanna deviate from the message Let's get back to this entrepreneur lesson Sometimes people do it to get out of stressing Working for the man to them becomes oppressive So they start a business for an income play But they ain't worried about growth so their income stays The problem is, if they ever see an income raise The IRS on their back, now income comes grades, you gotta have a good accountant, what to deduct, pay yourself your own salary, what is enough, don't get too passive with the money you clutch, or you gon' be a mechanic thrown under the bus, now let's talk about the bad and what people don't tell you, 97% of businesses end in failure, Facts. not cause what they did wrong, other reasons, let me break it down people, you go to a neighborhood restaurant, Every other weekend Been going since a kid Cause the owner was the beacon But he wants to sell it So the food is in season Other customers see that And start leaving Now they gotta shut the business down Where you eating Because the founder Ain't wanna keep it Another example to believe in Is how valuable is the product To those who need it Is it like breathing? Is it worth pulling my wallet out With the visas? Or should I pass Cause I ain't got financial freedom? These are things you gotta take into account A real entrepreneur Is never waiting it out They start one company, let it make an amount, and then sell it before it gets placed in the drought. And start another company every couple years after, and then repeat those steps kind of like Stairmasters. <laughs> this is not actually taught. These are gems that I'm dropping. Hope they actually get caught. Please. Another thing, stop trying to ask for support. If your product is good, then it's practically bought. So if your man makes something and you feel that it's basic and you don't support it, reinforce it with a statement. Invest in their dreams and say this. The best way to predict the future is for you to create it. And this is for the worker bees. Don't get cocky. You can pay for your work. Don't be snobby. Don't ask to be the boss, your whole shit sloppy Cause a brand new fighter just won't hit Rocky Ownership's not a reward for work, that's a paycheck Ownership's a reward for risk, that's the apex Ooh. Instead of double tapping asses and muscles Google and research the path to the hustle mm. Get you a mentor and ask about the struggle Learn from mistakes, don't brag, keep it subtle The last freestyle had the last nigga puzzled I ain't rap about a ring and how it flash on my knuckle A couple people said they was trapped in the bubble Till they heard my freestyle and they asked 
Yes, it's a double Ooh. Some education to get you a portion But self-education to get you a fortune Wanna get rich, it's a passion, trust me And some people so poor, all they really have is money This verse ain't facetious Take that lyric down and break the words in pieces Get you a nice life, work cohesion Get you one step closer to earn your leisure Yeah, you heard it, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, heard it. you heard it Listen, listen Listen Don't ever play yourself <laughs> Listen one take only. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mickey Fats has burned down my house, man. Yeah. I'm glad yeah. I got insurance. Gee, earned your leisure. <laughs> yes, sir. Leisure has been earned, y'all. First time ever. Yeah, first time ever or earn your leisure, man. Yeah, they're going to be hitting us up now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fact. Yo, That's yo, a fact. fam. I could, as long yo. as I know I was the first. Yeah, man. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yo, nah, just listen was, to my demo, bro. Nah, that was dope. That was that was dope for me, man. Once again, thank you for that. I appreciate it. Absolutely, so, absolutely. So yeah, this is gonna be this is this is dope because all right, so we got the freestyle and just burned it burned it down completely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now we're gonna go into the to the interview part of it to let people know who you are and then also to, to, to give information for, for artists out there that, that may not know yeah. the game. Right. Yeah. That you, that you have like we said, learn. it's not something that's taught, and there's no manual for it. People learn it on the fly, and the forefathers before, you know, maybe they were learning on the fly as well, so they didn't pass it down. So yeah. we're gonna get into that today. So yeah. can we talk about your journey? So it's interesting. So you were saying you was um you was in college, and yes. you was in NYU. Yes. And um, I guess after one year, you just figured that school route wasn't for you, right? Yeah. I mean, I was uh I was studying law, you know, and paralegal studies specifically, and um. I remember being in the front of um, criminal justice class, drinking a triple shot of espresso <laughs> with, with, with my coffee, still falling asleep. And you know, I feel like you know, and just education works for some people, but for others, is to retain some knowledge is just it just didn't work for me in that way. Mm. Um, so I decided that you know I was going to take something that I was doing as a hobby, seriously. So I was like, you know what, let me just, you know, at the time my manager and my a and was like, yo, if you really wanna do this, you gotta be serious and quit. So you started college um, already doing the music thing? Yeah, I was already doing music before I went to college. I had prolonged college for like six years. I had went 2007, I had graduated high school 2000. Mm. Oh, okay. So I, as soon as I got out of college, I did what most black people do, they just get a job because they wanna get to the money, mm -hmm. you know, they want money. So I went and worked for six years. And then I was like, all right, let me go to school to make my mother happy. But it didn't make me happy. So I just kind of left. 24,000 a year, couldn't take it. I was, yeah, I was literally, <laughs> and this was 05, 04, 05, I was making 24,000 a year, you know? So, so all right, so you decided to drop out of school. Mm -hmm. but what is it, like, what's your next steps in order to pursue your music career? I mean, at that time, um, the internet was just budding and MySpace? buzzing. Yes, I was on MySpace heavy. Um, and we were changing top eights. We was making people change their top eights, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and we just kind of, we. I had a graphic design person who knew how to work with the HTML and had our backgrounds looking good. So we was, you know, we was a kind of ahead of the game in that aspect. So when people would go to my page, they would see it was completely different from what other MySpace pages were. And um, we were also utilizing Facebook and Twitter around this time. This is before it was like what it is today. So we were using the internet when the, when hip hop was denouncing the internet. Mm -hmm. Like hip hop was denouncing we, yeah, it. Yeah, at that time music's being stolen. So Music like, was right. It was being pirated still, but people were still purchasing. It didn't go into the era of free music just yet. Okay. Like you could get freestyle, like people would still buy music, but people would go on these sites to get freestyles and certain videos, you know what I'm saying? Cause there wasn't, I think iTunes was out, but it wasn't like concrete just yet. Yeah, so you, you built a team um, mm -hmm. around you? So, yeah. Like so, who was consisted in this team in the early days? Um, It was uh, Saint, he was my manager and creative director. Then I had Steve-O, who was also creative director slash um, a and mm -hmm. I had a stylist, Quaz. Um, I had a producer, uh, Precise. I had my own personal assistant, Lakita. I had a hype man. So how did all this come about, though, as far as like, all right, you leave college, I'm assuming you don't have any money. I had $10,000 saved. All right, so how do you fund the operation at the beginning stages? I mean, in 2007, um, from what I remember, 
we I put all my money into a project called Flashback, which was basically rapping over old school beats. But we had my producer remake them to be newer. We wanted to get DJs, to, but DJs were too expensive. So we just basically created it and put it on MySpace. When we saw it didn't do anything, we put it out July 27, 2007. When we saw it didn't do anything, I started working on another project called Heaven's Fallout. And I sampled the Geico commercial beat. Everywhere I go. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and I rapped over that. When I rapped over that, it started to gain attention because it wasn't a typical hip hop beat. Then I sampled um, uh, arms, arms, the Arms Race remix, which had Kanye on it and the Fallout Boys and Gym Class Heroes. Okay. The Gym Class Heroes and Fallout Boys management heard that and called me up and was like, okay, we want to make you a part of um, this team. You know, we want to manage you. And this is all of my space. And this is like unheard of around this time. And then I put another record out called Stop Me. I sampled Daniel Merriweather. And then I sampled um, another track called Tokyo Shit. When I did that, that's when Fader picked me up. Oh, Fader, okay. And then after, once Fader picked me up, Mind you, this is no, I didn't have no money. We, did, we haven't spent a dollar yet. Once Fader picked me up, everybody picked me up. URB, Billboard, Rolling Stone, um, Vibe, The Source. The Source and Double XL were actually the last people to pick me up. But at that point, we were using the internet when other rappers really weren't. Like it was a couple of us, like me, Cuddy, the cool kids. Um, the cool kids, wow. Um, Wale, we were like the the ones using the internet to get out. Whereas there was like, at that time, it was like 50 Cent, Kanye, they were all still doing the traditional. There was still like a crew love type situation, right? right? Like you, your then, crew was hot and then somebody from that crew would spawn off and they right. would blow up. But also the labels just didn't know how to maneuver on the internet. Mm -hmm. They tried to fight Napster. They tried to fight technology. They, fight, they tried to fight all of that. And they didn't realize, like there were guys that, were more popular than me in the streets, but I was touring, like I was traveling. I went to Japan, I went to China before I performed in New York City by myself, you know what I'm saying? Because I had fans all over the place and DJs at the time in New York City were charging way too much money. I, I just couldn't afford it. So I made the internet my fan base. And then when I did that, I started putting a song a week out. Every week I put a new song out, every week for free. And when people saw the work ethic on that, it just kind of was like when, a mushroom. When you say DJs were charging too much, yeah, you mean in the that. sense of DJs playing the records on the radio or DJs making actual records for you? DJs playing the records on the radio, DJs to take your song and put it on a mixtape, DJs to host your mixtape, mm. DJs to play the music in the club, DJs to play the music at events, DJs just to hear the song, they wanted money. <laughs> so That's crazy. Payola. Payola. That's a real thing? Payola is a real thing. If anybody's not Payola, that's when you pay people to play uh, music on radio stations. It's a federal offense, right? It is a federal offense. So people really do that? You know. <laughs> not, like, I'm not putting you on the it's, spot. It's I'm one of those things. Kidding. It's one of those not things where. Not trying to get where, anybody incriminated. No, no, no. I mean, it's one of those things where, like, if you hear a song on the radio, or, I mean, first of all, I believe all of us in here. We grew up in the era of the 90s and the 2000s, Hot 97. It wasn't Power 105 at that no, point. No, no, no. We all, I'm yeah. not, I'm, I, we all tried to call up the Hot 97. Did <laughs> any of us ever get through? No. No. Never. I remember trying to call when, when uh, DJ Red Alert was on Kiss FM. And did you ever get through? Never, man. Never. And you're not, you weren't going to get through because it's already a programmed kind of situation. The, the music is already programmed for Program, what they're gonna play. The program yeah. director. They already, the, the songs are already programmed to play because of how popular it was already, it already was or because the label paid for that. Mm -hmm. So, all right, that's interesting. I didn't know that even to, um, for the DJs to even yeah. hear your record. Yeah, all you ever hear is like, yo, I don't take money, I don't take, that's all do I've DJ, Do DJs have too much power? Not anymore. They used to? They used to have tons of power. Yeah, well, cause I would imagine like, in that, and there was a certain time when DJs would break the record. Right, right now, like 
The internet's breaking a record. Yeah, they, I mean, they, people break their own records. I mean, it, I, I mean, when I was when I was on Jive, I was frustrated because I was like, they they wanted me to do the DJ stuff and DJ Rich, and 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 I want to say I'm not against DJs, yeah. but I felt like it was archaic because like, at some point, like people are not going to go to the radio to listen to music anymore. Yeah, they're all now they're listening to music on Spotify, they listen to music on Tidal, they're listening to YouTube, you know, yeah. YouTube. Yeah. So it, I felt like it was archaic, and they didn't want to hear me with at the label. They was like, "No, you still got to do it. You still got to do it." I was like, "Okay." Yeah. Now, you know what's crazy it's, is that like the first time I heard about Takashi was like I think a year and a half ago, and it was Uncle Murder's um, yearly recap. He does like the yearly recap. Yeah, he got yeah, some yeah. Skills. So he mentioned his name, and when he mentioned his name, like I I like Googled him. Like I, I looked on Instagram, and I, when I looked on Instagram, he had two million followers. Yeah. So I'm like. How's he? Have, he's from Brooklyn. He got rainbow hair. <laughs> yep. I'm like, I never. That's the. But I say yeah. that to say, I was so out of the loop. Right. Two yeah. million people had already been following him. He's on tour overseas. He was already hot, and I only heard about him because of Uncle Murder said his name. Yeah. He was way bigger than Uncle Murder. Right. The radio's only paying twelve records. If you listen to it, it's just twelve records over and over. Just right. the time span, and then like they have maybe a new at two section. Right. That's like forty five minutes throughout a day. Most people are in their cars. It's the same records over and over, unless they're doing like. A show like an interview is coming on. That's it. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, like, like what Rashad just said. Like this, I find new artists, and I'd be shocked that they have over five hundred thousand followers. I find new artists all the time, and they just have tons and tons of followers, and they sell out venues. They don't, and I'm one million percent sure they didn't pay a DJ to be on the radio. They didn't pay anybody to make it happen they just kind of had their own following people f brought into their brand like mm -hmm. i said in the rap and they were connected to it and that's what made them pop yeah that's one of the things i think um brooklyn johnny has said that he's like you want to make it get hot where you are yep right in your town then your city will be in love with you mm -hmm. then your state will find you and mm -hmm. then by that time it's the industry over. will come get you yep that's how it works so all right so in the next segment we're going to talk about your experience going from a major to being independent and right. everything in between so. right all right so you was telling me that um you you actually have an interesting experience because you you, you see, you've seen all sides of the game yes from from living the high life being on major yep labels to having um endorsement deals from fortune 500 companies yep to being independent and yep. having to grind it out yourself so yeah. all right um, can we talk about your experience on, on, on the major labels and how, how did that work out for you? Is it like, cause everybody talks about majors mm -hmm. and majority of people that always talk about majors is always, a, it's, it's interesting to me. Like even when Kissing Them was on the radio a few years ago and they said that they was going to like throw Puff off a roof and all that. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting because everybody <laughs> has bad, <laughs> shout out to, shout out to Kissing Them. Oh, that was, that was, um, that was a memorable time. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Beautiful I'm time. glad they worked that out. But, um. <laughs> Everybody always has negative things to say about major labels. Right. But everybody always signs to major labels. Yeah. I, you know, I heard Jim, like Jim Jones was probably one of the, the biggest independent artists, mm -hmm. right? And um, he had said, you know, independent, independent until recently. He's like, yo, you need the major because there's certain things that they can provide that you can't as an independent artist. Yeah. So your, your, your experience, how was it being on, the, because you're on a few majors. How was, how was that experience? I mean, it was... It was a great experience, and then it was like a, a weird experience. So the great experience of it was, it was more clout for everybody, basically. So like once you say, oh, job recording artist, Mickey Fax, it's like, oh, everybody's kind of like <laughs> all over you, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, but essentially what it is is a bank loan. You know, They give you a lot of upfront money, um, and you use that money to um, live off of and fund your project. You know what I'm saying? Use that. And so they give you half up front. Mm. And that half of whatever you sign for is to live off of. That's the advance? That's the advance. And then the other half of the money is for your marketing budget and whatever else that you spend, studio time, features, um, production, things like that. And basically, if you run out of your money, of the upfront advance money, um, then you have to kind of grind it out, but it's limitations on what you could do because the label still owns your name, content, and things of that nature. Before, I, but one thing with me, like before I did my deal, 
I had the Honda commercial. I had a sponsorship with Puma. I had EA Sports scenarios. So I had my own merchandise. So when I signed to Jive Battery, they couldn't take, they couldn't 360 me because I was already moving and I was already, I already had certain situations put in place. Um, so that was the good part of it, you know, and being able to meet uh, people that were in the industry, go to their parties, the events, and, and you know, eat for free and things like that. <laughs> but, you know, um, when it was time to kind of put the, the music out, uh, Jive had folded. So um, everybody that was on Jive at the time, Justin Timberlake, Chris Brown, uh, myself, uh, I, there was a couple other artists that was on there, like big pop artists, like they were a big pop label. Um, we all were in limbo. Um, so I got moved to RCA and had a whole nother team, a whole nother deal. And uh, it was rough because it was people there who didn't believe in the project in the first place to sign me. You know, so I had did a record with John Legend at the time. I did a record with Bruno Mars. I did a record with Yellow Wolf. And they just didn't, the a &R just wasn't fans. They didn't understand the music. They didn't understand it because he he, he wasn't invested into it. Cold chilling labels. So one <laughs> thing one thing that you said was interesting because like I said we we grew up on hip hop and like even in my brain like I have it's weird like somebody will say something and then a lyric triggers that right. I remember from fifteen years ago. Right. So one of the greatest rappers of all time, Cannabis. Right. He is one of the greatest. Not, yeah, I'm not. No, we're not denying that. <laughs> no, 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 no. From nine six to nine eight, eight was, <laughs> was pretty Can't crazy. Nah, nah, nah. His nah he's, he's, it didn't work out for him, but people won't remember him. No, 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 no. He's one of the greatest rappers he, of all time. That boy got. But busy. one of the things that he always said that stuck with me. He said, um, he said, did you ask your, your label if it was recoupable? I'm sure the vehicle was probably beautiful, but did you actually your label if it was recoupable? So you talked about like the advance. So mm -hmm. can you just break that? Because I'm actually interested to know, like. They give you a million dollars, right? Right. But that's your budget, right? Yes. So now out of that million dollars, your studio time is the on the second half of the budget. So if you get if I had a million dollar deal, I would get five hundred thousand up front. Okay. And out of that five hundred thousand, automatically my attorney has to get paid, my manager has to get paid, my accountant has to get paid. They keep the other five hundred thousand dollars to do everything that needs to be done in terms of marketing, studio time, features, and then the other. F well, if if it's five hundred thousand that I keep, I would probably keep three seventy five after paying everybody out. And with that three seventy five, I shouldn't go and buy a chain. I shouldn't go and buy a car, a, a super expensive car at least. I should buy something that's practical. Buy a home, buy a practical car. And wait until, you know, you're you're touring and you start seeing publishing and things like that, because it's basically a loan. And it's taxed also. It is taxed. So the three seventy five is really like two fifty. I like can that. you could have it taxed or you can take it up front and handle it on your own. I took it all up front and handled it on my own and paid the taxes later on. Yes. So when a label says that, and we hear that a lot of times, they're recouping the money. How's that happen, right? They're recouping the money off of your record sales. Mm. All right, so the money that they gave you as advance, they're taking it back from what you sold. Yes. In the event that you sell. In the event that you sell. In the event that you don't. In the event that you don't, you're in the red, they could write you off as a tax, as a, as a tax, know, write -off? tax write off, or uh, you're in debt. <laughs> you're on the label. You're in the red, yeah. So how is it as far as label politics, as far as, because you said when you switched labels, mm -hmm. the other label didn't believe in, in the project the way the first label did. Right. So like, I always wanted to do this too, where it's like, people push their albums back. Like, how did, what is it to say, okay, you're green lit for a release in April, your single's coming out. Like, how does that look from the inside? Because a lot of people, we just see from the outside as fans, this person's album keeps getting pushed back yeah. or this person, could, but we don't know like, the single might not have worked, or they wanted him to go in a different direction. Like, how does that work? Yeah, a lot of ain't cleared or something like that. Right. A lot of times, it's analytics that people that the other people in the office is you know doing. So they'll put a record out for a feeler, or you know, to to test it at radio to see what's going on, what's the response. Um, and if they're not getting another, if they're not getting a good enough response, they're not gonna start putting gasoline to the fire because the fire is already out there when the song is on the radio it's in the dj pool it's uh you you you, you send it to the tastemakers or whatever but the consumer hasn't gotten to the record just yet so they used to have a mix show now everything is streaming you know what i'm saying but before um it was all mix show um 
uh, tastemakers. You had to do DJ meetings. You know, go to the go to different uh, cities and go to the the, um, the radio station and talk to the DJs and b- basically beg them to play the record. And um, they would play it during the mix show hour, which would be before prime time, five to seven. The DJs have free range to kind of play whatever they wanted to play. And if there was enough impact on the record, they were added into rotation after the label would then put money behind the song. So the label would make their money back off of licensing the song. The label makes their money back off of the radio spins. The label makes their money back off of the publishing, sometimes the royalties, and as well as album sales. So that's how the label... But then when they, when they, st- when they saw that Napster was coming around, that's when they started the 360 deal. So I need 10% of, of your, your tour. Everything. Yeah. I need 10% of everything, yeah. basically. So like when when you said they make it back off the album, is that when the points come into to play? Yes, that's what points come into play, and everybody gets a point. So basically, you give a point to this producer for making a beat, or if they made like if I paid Swiss to do three beats, I would give him a point on the album along a with a point, his a feet. percentage, a percentage, yeah, out of like one hundred. It's like you get ten to twelve points on an album. On an album, and. The points go, one point goes to a executive producer, one point goes to another executive producer, then you give one to producers who make beats, you take like two or three points and then the label keeps the rest so of the So a points. point is 10% really? Yeah, basically. So a guy like J. Cole who produces the album, has no features and executive produce, he's keeping all the points. Yes. So what's the difference between points and masters? Masters are the master recordings that you own. So. If this, let's just say Earn Your Leisure was a studio Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't sign a record deal. If I pay you to record here, I own my masters. If I come here for free to record here, Troy owns the masters. You know what I'm saying? Rashad owns the masters. If I sign a record label, if I sign a record label, if I sign a record deal, I relinquish my rights to the masters depending on what kind of attorney I have. So now black artists are now starting to be a little bit more smarter and they want to own their masters. Mm-hmm. But before everyone was intellectual and smart, people signed their masters away to get that upfront money, not knowing that the master recording is basically and essentially the foundation of owning your music and your money. So if, for example, uh, I'll use Outcast for an example. Um, I think they wanted, I think there was a, uh, the label wanted to, I think, license one of their songs for the Super Bowl. Mm. And it was a very big record and a a very big commercial. Big Boy signed this licensing thing, the label signed it, but Andre didn't want to sign it. So because Andre didn't want to sign it because they owned some of their masters because they made so much money, yeah. they weren't able to use the record. I don't, people don't even know that. Like Outkast has the, the biggest hip hop selling album of all time. Right. But in the event that they didn't own a portion of their masters, the label could have said, we're selling, we're licensing this song and we're going to keep the money and they get a piece of the money. Thank you for performing. Right. And then, and then the publishing is when... The writing. The writing of, and, the, of, the, and, of right. the... Right. And, so, and the composition. Yes. So a lot of times people get publishing confused when they read credits. Right. So when you consider someone like Drake, right? People say Drake has ghostwriters and da 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 right? When you look at the credits and you see someone like Drake's name, you see Aubrey Graham, right? And you see about 10 other names. They're like, oh, Drake has nine other writers. <laughs> no. Sometimes, <laughs> I'm, I, I, I want to say, I, I say 99% to 100% of the time he's writing his records. I feel like that one time that you know he had- uh, The reference track? We're yeah. not even gonna say the guy's name. For the entire, for the entire song? Yeah, Can that one stop? time, I think, I, think it was, I think he was trying to give someone a shot. Exactly, you helping people out. You know out. what I'm saying, he was giving somebody a shot, right? And it leaked. But and when you see 10 names on a project, Music is written. There is a producers write music. It's not just producing. You you're writing the music. Mm-hmm. So there are writers on the song as well. And if it's a sample, the people that they sampled are also in the credits. They're writers right. as well. They're writers as well. So I don't want people to like you might you like if you check credits, you'll see Jay Z, 
and a bunch of other people. And a bunch of yeah. other people. But that doesn't mean people wrote Jay Z's lyrics. I probably made more money off your album than you. Well, you see Jay Z's <laughs> name on other people's. But you know, I I cha- listen. I challenge people to look at the old albums. Yeah. And know if you know some of these rappers' governments' names. Yo, that was crazy. That's exactly how I started knowing everyone's name. I would read the credits. I'm like, wait, yeah, who that point, that is point, cool? That point CDs used to actually. Yeah, you, you have, have to says, open them you up. Open it, and you can see who wrote it. And right. The opening credits and all yeah. of that. So. All right, so this is an interesting conversation because it's very complex, um, and you obviously are a very intelligent person, right? But you're taking a kid off the street with Oof. no education. Oof. How is he supposed to navigate through masters, publishing, points, budgets, recoupable? Yeah. How do you, how? how? And it, it's, it's interesting <laughs> <He's> it's, <laughs> how? it's something that nobody taught you when you came in the game. Nobody taught me this. You know what I mean? So it's like. But a lot of it was also because I was working at a law firm, like you guys heard in the freestyle, so like I would, give my contracts to the junior partners at the firm mm, smart. and we will all look at it together and they will break things down to me. So I kind of understood my contract. So I had them checking my attorney's work, you know, and I'm checking their work, you know what I'm saying? Um, lawyers checking lawyers. <laughs> and for a kid, I mean, I, I wasn't taught a lot. I wish I was, um, but you know, in this game, I just feel like, you know, black men for whatever reason they're just not you know reaching back uh, or maybe there is a disconnect i won't i don't want to say black men are not reaching back maybe black men do want to reach back but i feel like there's a language barrier that has to be kind of severed in order for us to kind of you know interact with the younger generation you know what i'm saying i feel like sometimes the the younger generation they have this pushback to the older generation because they're the gatekeepers you know i, I went through that as a young artist but if a older artist would have came to me and be like, listen, you need to do this, 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 that, and that, and that, I would have listened. You know what I'm saying? As far as your question, what does a young kid do? Man. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I would suggest, you know, being headstrong and, and trying to find a mentor. That should be the number one thing to do. Um, someone who actually cares about your career, someone who actually knows the business and knows what to do and how to navigate around certain things because there is no retirement plan in music. There is no 401k plan in music. There is no health care in music. There is no dental plan in music. I have my own separate insurance. I have my own, sep- I pay a lot for insurance. I, I, we, uh, I have my own 401k plan, own life insurance. You know, I have to take care of these things myself because if I don't, nobody else will. No, it's interesting you say that because yeah. like when we spoke um, off camera and I was saying that like Siegel one of our favorite rappers. Mm-hmm. So when he said um, with no union, no Look. dental plan, I can't eat off a hundred grand. I got cavities in I got fillings. cavities I need filling. <laughs> Yo, so when you, when, when I, like these are things that no until Siegel said that I never even thought about it. Like rappers have no union, right? No union. Right? Like even actors have a union. Yep. Yeah. Rappers have no. And I heard Norby saying like they, like it, like they should try to have a rappers union. Yeah. It's imperative because it's like even on a label, do they do they have benefits on the label? Yes, you do get benefits on the label. Okay. Um, but you have to opt into it. Um, you have to pay into it. And again, once rappers get a check, that's it, man. And is it the same if they get dropped from the labels? Like if I get fired from my job, obviously I'm not part of that anymore. That's it. So once you drop from the label, you drop? Yeah. Wow. I I mean, it's it's one of those things where they're taking uneducated, impoverished black young men and young girls and throwing money in their face. So think about us, 18, 19 years old, 17, even 20. If someone offers you a ton of money, you're not thinking about 401k. You're not thinking about health insurance because that stuff already comes out your check. And, and it's interesting because I feel like most Americans probably wouldn't think about that shit either if it wasn't already taken out of the check. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you put this stuff in front of a, a young black kid, they're not thinking, that. the first thing they're thinking about is getting drippy. That's a getting fact. lit. That's a fact. How fast That's a can we get? I lit? didn't buy a chain. I like I didn't buy a chain when I when my advance. I did not. I wanted a, I wanted a place to live. You know, I wanted my own place to stay. You know, and that was the first thing that I did. You know, what I'm saying I didn't get a chain. I didn't get a nice car. I had a free car. Shout out to Honda. But I I didn't want 
any of that like because i knew i had to recoup the money and i knew i had to live off of this money even though i had a booking agent i knew at some point the the, the hotness would dissipate you know what i'm saying so i had to save and stack my bread and that's another thing too like you said with the hotness a lot of times you feel like you're invincible when you and you'll be hot forever exactly yeah. it's like i got this i'm on top of the world but in three years you're not on top of the world yeah, anymore. Exactly. You, already, you already spent your bread. Yep. So it's like, what do you do? You don't have any formal education. Right. And I always said the music business, I want to ask you this, because we, we like being in, like we're interviewing people now, and we're mm-hmm. kind of like making all rounds around the, the music industry. Mm-hmm. So I told Troy, I'm like, this this music industry, I remember Chris Gotti told us this when we interviewed him, shout out to Chris. He was like, this, <coughs> this isn't a real industry. Mm. It's the only place where you can be a high level executive with no qualification, <laughs> like you know what I'm saying. Right. Like you, you, you right. know that's to, true. Yeah. <laughs> now, I mean, it's, we 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 ran we run into people and, and we're like, like, really? Like how do you how are you qualify? <laughs> how, how did this happen? To to give somebody a million dollar budget, you don't you just friends with somebody? Yeah. Or you just you was hanging out with them the and right they put you on right and right now or you intern and you, you have learn. a good ear and it's like we have, have a good ear. Like what? You pick the right record. <laughs> You were there at the right, <laughs> right. time, and that and, happened to a lot of guys. And you're a senior executive because you picked the right guy that time. Yep. But then somebody else told us that that's kind of done on purpose because the higher ups keep it unorganized, unprofessional. Because it's like a bunch of chickens just running with their heads cut off. The artists don't really know what they're doing, but a lot of executives don't really know what they're doing either. But the high level executive owners, oh, they, know. they know. Yeah. So if you keep, if you keep them like kind of drugged up and they don't really know they're late to meetings and it's very it's, it's not it's not a real business it's not run like a real business <laughs> they're late to meetings. no it's real it's not run like a real business like I, yeah. so I, I was going into the off I was going into the label every like twice a week and they, it, it was to the point that they, people thought I was an employee there because I just wanted to know what was happening with my project every two days I just needed to know you know what I mean and that's how I was able to have a great rapport with a lot of the the people that were there, I was about to call them coworkers, but they technically were my coworkers, you know. And you know, I feel like artists just just, just let things, they just let things go how it's supposed to go. Yeah, it's like I just want to create the music. Mm-hmm. I just want to create that, the music. That's what Jeezy said. Yeah, Jeezy has a clip that's one viral on Instagram saying that he got taken advantage of because he 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 wasn't educated. Pretty much paraphrasing, he wasn't educated on music business. Yeah. He had lawyers that screwed him over, mm-hmm. and he felt. He, he felt intimidated to even let somebody know what was going on because he's Jeezy. He's yeah. a snowman. So it's like for him to get ripped off, it's embarrassing. Right. And he just went with it because he didn't know. He didn't yeah. know what to do. Yeah. How do I tell somebody like I'm the snowman and this little guy over here with a bow tie <laughs> dropping me <laughs> every day? Right. I mean, it's, it's frustrating because there should be some sort of educational workshop for new artists that come into the game. There's so many people that don't know anything about the music business. And a lot of times these guys, they some of these guys don't finish high school and they, you know, they they get into the game and they just think the money's going to come in forever. But think about like or if it comes at all. Right, but think about 10 years ago who was here 10 years ago then and, and it's not here now. You know what I'm saying? Or even 20 years ago like a mill <laughs> like, and that's not a show. No, no, no. That's a fact. It's just a fact. That was that was twenty years ago. Yeah, yeah. gone. Time, time flies. You know, and she was a talented artist, but she's yeah. not here no more. Like, I'm not saying that. I, I don't think I want to be here. You know, past another ten years. But what I'm saying is, utilize this time to to ask questions. There's nothing wrong with asking questions. I feel like sometimes we're just so prideful. And there's certain things that we just don't want to know or we're too afraid to ask. You know what I mean? And for me, I asked questions. I, I, I'm always curious as to know why a certain person popped or how a certain person got hot or how they got hot in their town. What did they do to get to that next level? I absorb this information so I can take it. I mentor like about 10 or 15 kids. You know what I'm saying? Young artists, because I feel like that wasn't given to me. So I should give it back. You know what I mean? And it's imperative that these kids know these things because this this is our future. No, that's a fact. So that's a perfect segue into our last segment. We're going to talk about the independent game, what you got going on now. And um, yeah, educate people. When, uh, we talk about the major side, but we're going to talk about the independent side. Yeah. yeah. All right. So in the last segment, we're going to talk about the journey, your journey as an independent artist. This is something I think is extremely valuable because, as I said, there's a lot more independent artists out there, especially now. Millions of them. Than our major um, label artists. So, all right. 
how does it work being an independent artist, right? As far as um, is it is it you fund the stuff yourself, or is it that they funded a hybrid approach? Like, how does that work to be an independent artist? I mean, there's different ways to be an independent artist. Um, the best way to just kind of explain it is just tell my story real quick. I mean, after leaving the label in 2012, um, at the beginning of 2013, I had $90,000 in the bank. And then at the end of 2013, I had $4.14 in, in my bank account. I made a song about it. It's called 414. Yeah, you remember. I was about to say, <laughs> I remember. Yeah, <laughs> because I remember looking at the, my, my bank statement like, this is That's humbling. unbelievable. And that... I think my back was against the wall because like we said earlier, um, I didn't have any job experience from 2013, well, from 2007 to 2013. So I'm looking at six years of just not working, just doing music. So I panicked. I tried to get a job. It didn't work. So I was like, okay, I have to be an artist. Even though I had, I quit, I was like, I'm not doing this anymore. And then I was like, well, I gotta pay rent. So from that point, I had to kind of figure out and navigate what my supporters were going to um, buy from me as a as a consumer. So I realized that they appreciate my lyrics, they appreciate my honesty, they appreciate merchandise, they appreciate seeing me. So I had to create this whole, I had to basically start all over again. And but I started all over again with a cushion because I had a fan base, um, so I had to make merch. I spent all the money myself. Um, I funded everything myself um, with a little bit of money that I had. Um, you know, I was working with new artists, you know, doing features and taking that money and reinvesting it to be able to sustain a living. Um, and so now I'm in a position where it is a hybrid situation where I fund some of it and then I have Soul Spasm uh, funding some of it as well. So it's a partnership we come together and then you know we split the costs down the middle. Okay, so how is it as far as like, do they distribute your music as well? Yes, they distribute all my music on all streaming platforms um, and they handle that side of it. So I'm able to give them my whole catalog uh, they take a percentage off of that catalog, and I get a check every month. So everything you did prior to coming to the independent label, you have. And I they, own. They yeah. You own it. Okay. I own everything. Yeah. Okay. Even from the label, because again, I didn't sign a 360 deal, and I was in the black. I was not in the red. So all right. So as far as like um, press, um, do you do you handle that yourself, or is that you get help with that? Or I handle my press myself. I mean, on my last project, we hired. A publicist to do the work and he got me on you know some some online sites and some playlists on on some streaming sites and you know some radio on Sirius Satellite and things like that so that stuff always helps um, but for the most part a lot of it is relationships having your own relationships building your own relationships so like I can hit sway from sway in the morning on my own and be like I want to come up there or just even how I'm up here like yeah, I, I, hit Rash yeah. I hit Rashad myself and was like yo I want to come up here you know yeah how, how about Tori I know you mentioned you had a booking agent mm -hmm. is that still true and or do you handle that now yourself yeah I handle all my booking now I mean I had an agent last earlier this year but it just didn't work out the way I wanted it to work out and even previously I had agents before um but you know, I have a baby on the way. I have a wife at home. So, if they're not booking me the shows, I have to book my shows myself. Okay. And I hire promoters to you know get the people in there along with promoting on my own and making it happen. And you know, renting a, a van on my own. You know. So yeah, you're putting the money up yourself. Yeah, I put up the money myself. So all and right. Hit the road. So um, you talk about streaming. How much do you get paid for streaming? Like, what's that breakdown? Because I've seen a bunch of different numbers on the internet, like mm -hmm. a quarter of, of a fraction of a penny for every stream. Is there a set number that everybody gets for streaming? Or yes, everybody gets the same set number. It's like zero point 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 point. No, it's point point point. It's zero point zero 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 six, and then the numbers is like pi, <laughs> three point four. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, but it's basically. 0 0.0006 and then you have to make you have to stream so much in order to see like a decent jack 
What's the what's the one that you get paid from the most? Like streaming service, is it Title? They say Title is the is the one, is the one you one get that the, gets paid most, the most. You get paid the most from Title, but you still need all all streaming sites in order to get a decent check. You can't just put Rely something on, on Title. Yeah. So, for instance, like what my um, when my uh, pay sheet comes in every month, you know, it's not just Title. It's Title. It's Spotify. It's Pandora. It's Apple Music. It's iTunes. When people purchase the music, which is mm. always the best, mm. um, because you keep eighty percent of the of the money. So if it's ninety nine cents, you keep eighty cents of that. Apple takes twenty cents. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So that's um, that's the best. And then YouTube as well, and Vimeo and TikTok now. TikTok. So. Is good, yeah. Combine these seven to eight uh, companies, and you should receive a decent check. A so decent how, check. How do you make it to those curated uh, playlists? Because like I'm now that you're saying, I'm thinking like songs just pop in there. Like once I download a certain playlist, if a new artist comes in, it just do you have to pay for that? Is it somebody at the streaming service that actually just says, "Oh, I like that song. We're putting that in there." I mean, sometimes it's the labels that own the playlist. Mm. Sometimes if you're very uh, cool with the people that run the playlist, you can get lucky. Or if you're a very popular artist and the song is very popular, they'll, the person who runs the playlist will put that song on the playlist. But, you know, the labels figured it out. <laughs> so they kind of have control of everything again. So, like, are your payments coordinated through, like, all seven that come to you streamlined at one time? Yes. From And that's from the label that, that puts it on. Yes. And then they, they, they cut the check. Then they take a percentage out of that and then they for putting... All right, so it's like CD Baby or something like that. Right. Or TuneCore. Or TuneCore, right. But Soul Spasm is my distribution, so... And I guess my checks would be different from another person's checks because I have 16 to 17 projects. Hmm. So I'm like steps ahead of someone who might only have two or three projects. You have leverage. Yeah. So like I'm getting a substantial amount of money every single month. That's mixtapes and albums combined, combined. right? Combined. But yeah. the mixtapes, all right, so let's talk about yeah. mixtapes. Mixtapes, that's, how does that work? Yeah. Same same thing? Because you put mixtapes on streaming services too, right? Yeah, well, now like, people are putting them on there, um, but before it was difficult, but I think you, you can put them on there now, but it's still, it's still. Still the same thing? Still yeah, the like what's thing. the difference? Like, a, I, like I know Drake put out a playlist then there was a, there's mixtapes and there's albums. Well, like Davies, yeah. he just came out with his first album, but he has like f six projects. Yeah, what's the difference? Previous that look like album to me. Sound like one. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the marketing rollout from the label. Okay, that's the only thing different because he was on he's on Mass Appeal Def Jam, I believe. Yeah. yeah. So Mass Appeal was handling the mixtapes and they were putting that stuff out. So he was probably. Um, getting financed by Mouse Appeal, they were they were handling that. But then this big project is a Def Jam thing. So like Def Jam is now handling the rollout. They're probably taking that budget from when he first signed four years ago or whatever, and now they're using that money to push this project like how it is. You know, okay, that's how it works essentially. How how about endorsements? I, I know you said that you have one with uh, EA Sports and Puma and yeah, um, Honda. Honda, of course. Yeah, you, you got those. Before. By yourself or? Yeah, I mean, a lot of that stuff was before I had did my record deal. So they just were interested in the brand. They built, they bought into who I was, what I represented. They saw that, you know, this kid is an image that can be pushed out there without being too flashy. That was one of the reasons why Honda chose me because I was not flashy. I didn't have a big chain on. I didn't have the crazy jewels on. I didn't come in there talking crazy. I was an intellectual. I was an everyday person. Now, what is a Honda? Honda's for everyday person. You know yeah. what I'm saying? It's a great car that lasts. Um, so, you know, that money was from them. And then Puma, um, you know, I worked with Puma for a little while. Uh, for like two years, they gave me product. I would wear the product and get that stuff seen all over because I was a sneakerhead. I'm still a big sneakerhead. Um, and then, you know, I also did. Uh, I also did EA Sports. I was very uh, cool with the music supervisor over there, Rafael Lima. Shout out to her. And we kind of just continuously worked for like five years. I was on like every EA game you could potentially think of, except for Madden. Like I was on like hockey. I was on <laughs> Need for Speed. I was on. FIFA, no, no, not FIFA. Pardon me. I was on The Sims. Like I have a Sims. Oh, The Sims. Yeah, that is a year. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, all you right. get royalty checks from yeah. from the game, the, the purchase. No, no, nah, you don't get royalty checks. You just get upfront check. Upfront check. That's it. Okay, but 
the commercial you got royalty checks. Yes, I got for royalty. as long as the commercial played. Yes, the commercial that commercial ran for about four or five years, and I was getting checks every day for four or five years. No, part of four or five months. Part of four or five months. Four or five months. Okay. And I was getting I was getting <laughs> checks every single day, every day. So they calculate like how many times it aired, and then they send you a percentage of that. Yes, yes. On top of my music being in it, and on top of me acting in it, like it was like three separate checks. Music check, acting check, and then a residual check. A lot of checks. It was a lot of checks. B. <laughs> <laughs> it was a lot of checks, V. So, all right. So, if I'm a kid that just loves music, I'm recording. Can you give me some advice? Like, how, what's the first steps? I, I don't have a major like break, record deal, but I want to get my music out there. What do I? What do I do? The first steps is to build a team. It's like a pyramid scheme, you know. That I used to sell Kirby vacuums back in the day, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and even like the the Cutco knives. And it was. I was say you selling Eastland boots too? Nah. Not the Eastland, <laughs> but you know, I I would have to go into these wild areas to sell these things. And whenever we would come back to base, they would always say to me, "You need to go to your friends' parents' homes, and you need to go to to their friends' parents' homes." and that's how it needs to happen. So I would tell a kid, start start a team. Start a team of five to six people, and everybody has to have a specific amount of network where they you know, push in your music consistently and constantly to different people. And it has to be, music has to be hot, and they have to concentrate not on the numbers. You know what I'm saying? Like, I feel like we're in an era of it's just so much clout and how many likes you have, and how many views you have, and this and that. There are artists that have more followers than me on on Instagram, they have more views than me on Instagram, more likes, and they're broke, and they don't know what to do with their career. They're in, they're in a rut, and I know artists that have less followers than me that are doing better than me when it comes to moving and shaking and getting mm -hmm. their stuff out there. Um, so it's all about focusing on exactly what your goals are, have people that are knowledgeable in your corner as well as having people that have the same goals and beliefs that you have and spread this word out to every and anybody that has ears that wanna hear it um, and just create create, <laughs> create content that people feel is valuable. You know, if you're not creating the content that people feel is valuable, then you can, you know, be a mechanic or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> how, how, how stressful is it? How stressful is it to be a to be an artist? That's another thing I don't think people fully understand. Like, it's not it's not easy profession. And, it, yeah, how stressful is it? I work 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Sometimes my wife is angry at me because I'm always working. But that's what it takes. I feel like if, like you said, some artists do get hot and then they stay hot for like two, three years and then that's it. You don't hear from them no more. You know what I mean? I'm one of those guys that's been out for 11 years now. I'm living off of music. I make six figures a year just independently. You know what I'm saying? And I know with a little bit more backing, I could crack seven figures easily because I know exactly what to do. I know how to do it. I know how to maneuver. Um, but a lot of guys, they don't. sometimes they just don't want to hear I feel like sometimes they just don't want to hear these these things. You know what I'm saying? Artists don't want to hear work, 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 work. They just want to get to the bag. It's all money. about the fast money. Fast money don't last too long. You got to chase it. Fast money don't last money. That's, <laughs> that's a good quote. You yeah. know what I'm saying? It just doesn't. You have to you have to diversify. Like I don't I don't just rap either. You know what I'm saying? Like I try to make investments on certain things like, you know, trying to buy a home, you know what I'm saying? Looking, I was just telling my man off camera, I'm trying to get a Tesla because it doesn't depreciate, it appreciates in value. Um, also just investing in um, different companies, like there's a company that, that's doing marijuana, uh, cannabis stuff, but it's from the health side of it. So it's called Glen Mayer Farms. You know, they are a, a, a farming agency that's using the, the medicinal portion of the cannabis, you know, legally and getting it out there legally because we all know marijuana is just on the verge of being, you know, legalized. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's something that, you know, as black people, you know, we're not 
you know, we're, we're drug heads. We're always smoking, smoking, smoking. We're always putting into it instead of reinvesting into it, into the medicinal aspect of it, which is the legal portion of it and the legal side of it where you can invest and make your money back yeah, on it. It's going to be some billionaires made. You know what I'm saying? It's going to be a lot of billionaires made yeah. if they make the right, you know, decisions and choices. So, you know, I'm always looking at what's the next thing that's going to happen. Virtual reality. That's another thing that is on the cusp of the gaming industry, mm-hmm. it's just you have to find the right one, you know? I think virtual reality is gonna be big. We yeah. haven't spoken about that yet, but I think that virtual reality is gonna be huge, especially in sports. Oh yeah, yeah it's gonna be. Sports. I think they tried that this year with the NBA League Pass where you get the virtual reality and you can sit courtside at sit the game. It's, it's perfect. Yeah. If you think about it, it's like, am I gonna pay $10,000 that only 1% of America has mm-hmm. to watch LeBron, or will I pay $100? Yeah, hundred dollars not bad. Yeah, right. some some to, sp- to feel like I'm literally right there, especially sports like boxing, right? Basketball, you can't that that courtside feel means a lot. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. that, that look is a lot. <laughs> that that's what I said, but that's one of those sports where it makes sense to do it. Like some sports are not great view, being viewed live, right? right? Like if I go to a football game and I'm sitting in an upper deck, I have no idea what's happening down there. Right, I just know that something stopped. Right, it's not like when you're on TV and you can actually hear the ref. Oh, that was the call. Oh, we can see the instant replay. Right. Some things just aren't made right. for, for live for consumption. Yeah, that's true. No, nah, this is well. I think they're going to do a combination of both, though. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. If you get the, the virtual reality, now you can see it. But you could probably hear a commentator talk about it too. That's yeah, true. that's why you see people at the games with their headphones on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This gonna it's gonna it's gonna get to that level. I just feel like you can't just want to just do music and that's it it's it has to be more it has to get into to acting a little bit get into creating a merchandise you know make something that people don't you know or won't create you know like be creative i i feel like these are the things that you know artists need to kind of take back not just their ownership in their music but the ownership in their imagination yeah, we just said i just it's funny you just said the word artist because a boogie he said next project is his last one because mm. he wants to focus on things outside of music and this is the time now while he's hot. Yeah. I, had a, I had a quick question. You said you were trying to get a job right before, like what What were you going to try to do? Anything. You're trying to do anything. All anything. Right. <laughs> anything at that time. I was desperate and there was nothing for me. There was literally nothing for me. And, you know, I had shows lined up, but I had to wait to get the second half from those shows to even, you know, make some money so I had to kind of I had to thug it out you know I was trying I was trying to work at I was too overqualified for Burger King and underqualified to work in the office again so I was just like All right, I gotta do music how does that work I'm glad you said that when everybody talks about like getting paid on the back end for the shows you get paid up front 50% and then after you perform you get the next 50% that's usually that's standard that's standard yeah that's standard right after you perform sometimes before you get on stage sometimes after Depends. Because I've heard like artists not get on stage because the, they don't, the promoters yeah. don't have money. Well, sometimes the promoters do pay for play. So, you know, they'll charge, you know, artists to sell tickets before the main act gets on so they can make the rest of the money to pay the, the headliner. Have you had bad experience with promoters before? Not a lot, but I've had some, I've had some bad experience. I mean, the best, the best shows that I've had was corporate shows. Because you're gonna get it's paid. It's corporate money. It's corporate money. <laughs> yeah, you that money's guaranteed. You can go on stage without getting paid, and you you know you're gonna get paid eventually. Like, or you'll sue. So, um, those are the probably the best shows. You know, there's contracts put in place where you have to sign a contract, a, a music agreement, a performing agreement with uh, a buyer, a talent buyer, that uh, you will get paid before the night is over or at the end of the night when you settle up, depending if you did a door deal or depending on if you get a guarantee. So let me ask you a music question before we wrap it up. Yes, sir. You, you worked with a lot of artists. Mm-hmm. Oh, um, like I said, from Drake to Justin Timberlake to all Kendrick. Even, Kendrick, and then underground artists as well, and mainstream art, everybody. You worked with a lot of different people. Right. Who who was um, the most enjoyable for you to work with as far as like the talent level? Like who did, because like I used to play ball, so like sometimes I play basketball with somebody I know like they're special. Like right. I played, like Mike Beasley went to school with me and I knew he was younger than me, but I knew like he was special. I knew mm-hmm. he was gonna make it to the league. Cause I just knew he was special. Right? Did you ever have that type of vibe with anybody like, that you worked with? Like this dude is different. Um. Yeah, I mean, it's a lot. I can 
be here all day. I mean, I remember when I got Drake's verse back for Overdose on Life. We were talking about that earlier. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, yo, this guy is fucking dope. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see it happening? Like, like people saying Drake is the best rapper of ever. Did you ever imagine he can be put in that category? No, not the best rapper ever. It was more like, it was more like, this guy's light skin, he's marketable. <laughs> <laughs> and he could rap really well. This was before he was singing, really. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, yo, this dude is dope. He, he got a knack for choruses and everything. And then, like, after we did that record, he kind of he kind of just ran into, not ran into, but I remember when he hit me, like, yo, like, I'm meeting Wayne tonight. I'm about to meet Lil Wayne tonight. Uh, the night that changed it all. And I was like, that's crazy, bro. Just, just, keep, just keep grinding. But that experience was just dope because, you know, he, he was a he was an unknown artist. He was nobody really knew who he was. When I put him on the record, like it was a big deal for him to be on that record. Mm. Um Styles P was a that was Styles, a oh shout out to Styles. Nine one four. That was an amazing session um where like he was doing features for other artists that came in the in that day, like and like the whole locks was there, and and it was he doesn't he doesn't write rhymes, right? Yeah, that's true. That's true. He didn't write his rhymes. He, he that's had crazy. Them all up here. That's crazy. So I I was like I was like yo like I want to do this record, bro. And he was like, I right, uh, how do you want to do it? I was like, I want to do uh, five eight bar verses. Mm. And he knew where my talent level was, so he kicked everybody out the studio. He's used to that going back and forth with Kiss. Yeah, yeah, that but means. yeah, but he. It was the fact that he kicked everybody out. Like, <laughs> why did he kick everybody out? Because it was just too crazy. He was like, everybody got to go. It's me, you know. And, but he stayed with other artists when they did their records. Okay. Other artists were still there. Everybody had to go when it was me and him, and we just, we just did that record. It was, that that joint was wild. You know what I'm saying? Number um, four legends. You know, a Royce. Royce was a dope session. Royce, Royce I asked him. Nice. I asked him to send me like twenty four bars. He sent me back like 32, 40 yeah. bars. It was just like, all right, you want to kill me on my own record? <laughs> Has um, that ever happened? Well, you got a verse back, and you're like, damn, I gotta go rewrite. I don't rewrite my verses. I all try right. not to rewrite them. But you ever felt like, yo, did he body me on this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I, you know, but I let it. I let it rock. Yeah, yeah, I let yeah, it rock. Yeah, yeah. Doing that four three two one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Shout the L though. You know what I'm saying. Um, and lastly, John Legend. I mean, when I worked with John Legend, he was on tour with Shad Day, man, and he, oh. and he, they, it was an overseas tour, and he came off tour when he had his day off in New York, and we went in the studio and, and made our record, and then I asked him. Can you do some stuff over? And he was like, sure. Like he was the nicest artist That's ever. Cool. You know, another like, super intelligent dude. Oh, I love John. John is just a good dude, man. I appreciate it. Just him taking that time out to work with me, you know, in that facility and capacity. You know what I mean? That's powerful, man. Mickey, we appreciate you coming, yeah, man. man. Can, you, can you tell the people? Oh, I know you on you on tour, right? You got a tour coming. Yes, up? yeah, I got a tour coming up. It's called uh, the Fam Tour. It starts November. 29th and it ends uh, December 12th. We doing Boston, New York, Philly, Baltimore, Virginia, North Carolina, Atlanta. You, you know, hopefully we'll put up the uh, the flyer here so you guys could check it out. Um, and uh, you know, just come check me out, MickeyFacts.com. If if you see some merch that you like or is there some music that you uh, he got the Enigma drink. yeah, he got the Enigma button uh, on. Yeah, yeah, Everybody, in hang, I got him a button. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, if if there's merch, you know, hoodies, shirts, uh, hats, thumb drives, uh, what else we got on there? Um, th there's a lot of stuff on there. Um, you can go there and cop, and also, you know, hit me up on Twitter, twitter.com forward slash Mickey Facts. Hit me up on Instagram, Mickey dot Facts, M I C K E Y the, the period, F A C T Z. DM me. I talk to every single person that reaches out to me. I feel like if you have you take the time out to talk to me, I will definitely uh, take the time out to respond to you. I think that's the polite thing to do, um, except for spam. I don't talk to spam. <laughs> um, but, you know, just reach out to me. If, if you feel like there's a question you might have, you know, feel free, reach out, because I feel like holding on to information is not the way to get information out. No, I appreciate that, bro. Thank yeah. you, Troy. Troy, yeah. house, housekeeping items? Yeah, shout out to everybody on Patreon.com. Y'all know that's our Proud to Pay program. Uh, it's five tiers. Uh, we are at over 100 uh, patrons, man. So shout out to everybody that, that is joining. Like we said, EYL University, uh, for our top um, our tier four and five members, you're going to be getting access to our webinars. So make sure that y'all 
go um, and check your messages so you can have access to the links every Wednesday at eight. Uh, and UIL, we actually put out some new merch, man. So we got the it's fire hoodie yeah. season is in, in effect. Yeah. Um, every every time we come on, we we putting out new merch. So uh, the, the the hats will be out. The, hopefully, we get some gloves out there, man. We 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 preparing for the winter, even though Scarves, we we don't gloves, like being in the winter. Is Scarves are gonna be there. Scarves is fire. <laughs> <laughs> so shout out to everybody that's been supporting the merch, man. We we got some new stuff on the way. Yeah, for sure. And then um, once again, don't forget December seventh and December eighth, we coming to DC. We doing a workshop for Mobile Home Elite and Wall Street Trap on the seventh. And then we got our very first live podcast. And then the Wizards Clippers game after that. Following after that, um, all of the information is on Elite.com on the events tab. You can live stream the a workshop if you're not there in person. EYL University. We have classes every single day. We have a class pretty much. Matt teaches a class on every Monday on real estate. Wednesday the class is different. Me and Troy are going to do classes on Friday. We're back. And then starting in January, we're going to launch EYL Espanol. Yes, every, yes. Every Thursday, yes, we're going yes. to do financial literacy. Excited about that. In Spanish. That's fire. Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All yeah, of yeah. our Latino supporters. Bueno. <laughs> <laughs> for sure, for sure. And the book tip of this week is the autobiography of Johnny Cochran. Oof. Recommended by our guest. Yes. Mickey. <laughs> yes. Great book, great book. I promise you. Great man. Really, really, really yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, Johnny Cochran, people don't understand how... You know what? The thing about Johnny, everybody knows him for the OJ trial, right? Yep. But he was a high powered lawyer way before OJ. That's yeah, how yeah, he got yeah. that's exactly. how Exactly. Because that was the dream team, but he was the the head. Right. And a lot of people some of like some of the lawyers felt the way because these is lawyer like Johnny Cockrow, Shapiro, like these dudes, Alan Dershowitz, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. they was high powered lawyers. Yes. yes. So the Johnny Cockrow he, he the Jordan in, on that and, team. And he's the quarterback. A yeah. lot of a lot of them felt the way about that. And he was working on Geronimo Pratt's case when he died. Mm, a lot of yeah. people don't know that either. Geronimo Pratt, um, legendary Black Panther leader, yep. who was incarcerated. Um, Mike Jack. Yeah. So he, he he did a lot of social change before the OJ case. Yeah. He did a lot of pro bono work because he was also uh, he was also a DA. Mm. Um, but he did a lot for South Central LA, man. Like because he was in the 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 thick of the racial uprising there. So I I implore all black people, please, pe- people of color, please read the autobiography of Johnny Cochran. That was an incredible book, incredible. So, so there you have yeah, it. So, all right, guys, thank you for rocking with us. We'll see you next week. Peace. Smicky. Peace. <laughs>